Our next speaker is Nathan Lyons, uh, who is a research professor at Tulane University. And Nathan has a broad interest in fluvial and tectonic uh, geomorphology. He's a passionate modeler and as such involved and very active in the Land Lab project. Uh, and Nathan will today present uh, life in landscape evolution models, investigations of uh, climate and tectonics as drivers of biological evolution. Uh, so Nathan, if you're there, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Albert. And so uh, in my talk, I will be uh, focusing on long-term, uh, long, uh, big time scale processes, climatic and tectonic forcings. That is not to say that these forcings don't have shorter time scale um, implications. The implications be, uh, most importantly, the effect of climate and tectonics on biodiversity. And so central to this talk are uh, landscape evolution uh, models. And so at the core of uh, landscape evolution models, they begin with uh, rock uplift, mass being uplifted, increasing the elevation of the ground surface. Superimposed on that is stream incision. And here you can see the how effective stream incision is to remove all that uh, material. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the, each of these parameters and talk about the details of them. I included them here in gray just to show at their most basic implementation, these processes are um, quite simple as they're implemented in uh, landscape evolution models. And that's just uh, a stream power incision. That's a, a common, simple formulation of stream incision. And last, hill slope diffusion you can see its effect on the landscape to round ridges, smooth hillsides, it is a sort of gravitational transport that moves moves hill slopes, uh, moves a, a mass more so at the smaller scale compared to stream incision that works at slight, uh, seems more effective at, at greater scales. So it's really these three processes of the stream incision, hill slope diffusion, that sort of kicked off the landscape evolution modeling that really got its stronghold in the 1990s. Since then, of course, there has been um, quite a bit, a bit of um, increases in the amount of processes, the, compl the complexities built into these processes. And this is just a small sample. And I included these 10 or so uh, because they also happen to be processes built into LandLab. The LandLab um, is a software, as uh, Greg introduced, that can be used to model surface dynamics. Uh, one can, a user, any of us can uh, plug and play or mix and match processes to build a model to explore the research questions that we have. Uh, the new uh, version, uh, LandLab 2, uh, it's now, I uh, can learn about it in the journal or surface dynamics. More pertinent to this talk is a new component I created called Species Evolver. And this component can be used to uh, simulate biological evolutionary processes as they interact with the landscape and the land lab uh, surface processes. And Species Evolver operates at geologic macroevolutionary timescales within uh, landscapes. And so these tools in this line of research in general aim to help us investigate biological evolution responds to climatic and tectonic forcings uh, and how we can use landscape evolution models in this pursuit. And hopefully we can learn not only about biological evolution, but something about climate and tectonics as, as Brad discussed in the introduction. Uh, the, the feedback is what I think is really interesting and potentially what, um, for example, that the example he used was vegetation and slope stability and how um, biological uh, history may impact um, sediment transport as well as erosion. So back to the block diagram. And so in this uh, block diagram, we can see at the time at 
as the landscape responds to the slip of a fault. You can perhaps imagine the landscape populated with simulated species and the, uh, the response of the landscape to that fault may redistribute the species and affect the evolutionary processes. So I'd like to demonstrate these tools in action in two examples. The first have to do with fish and, and um, stream rearrangement. And so this study is largely motivated by the global distribution of species richness. Richness is for other geologists in the room, uh, like myself, not too long ago, didn't know this term. And so this uh, just indicates the number of species in an area. And here it's the number of species in a one degree grid cell. And what I see first is it seems like there's a high richness of freshwater species, perhaps fish uh, are concentrated in the tropics, but that's not the only thing that's going on. It's not dark blue exactly in the tropics and light blue everywhere else. So there's other factors at play. So what I'm proposing here is that landscape evolution models can be used to explore these other processes and these other um, factors that um, that might affect uh, richness and biodiversity. So on the right side is an animated, I will play an animation of species evolver implemented in a model created with LandLab. However, let's first look at the lower left where's a diagram of the model. And so there are uh, stream networks draining to the north and to the south. Each color stream network is a distinct continuous stream network. And once the model starts, uh, there are very soon after it starts, there'll be a vertical fault that uplifts the right side of the model grid about 40 meters higher than relative to the left side. Now I'll explain the evolution dynamics as the model is going. And so with the gray scale, you can see it gets really white at the beginning, indicating there's been that uplift the block in the stream through range. And there's quite a few stream captures in the center center and top center. The stream capture would be uh, here is um, one right about here that happens at the beginning of the model run. It's a transfer of stream segment from one watershed to another. And because the species of simulated fish, uh, fish have been populated to this landscape, a, a population, a subpopulation of species are being transferred from one network to another. And so that means that a species has multiple populations and they become uh, reproductively isolated over some time that could potentially lead to speciation uh, as there is no gene flow uh, anymore now that um, the stream capture has caused a fragmentation of the species range. So on the phylogenetic tree on the right, you can see how we began with a few number of species and giving the implemented evolutionary processes in the model, the biodiversity has cre increased by about 25% in this model run. Um, due to uh, the rearrangement of streams. And so in that last animation, I showed just one model run of one perturbation, the perturbation being the fault. This, is, uh, this plot shows the results of, of several runs, about 25,000, where each dot is one model run, and the model runs, the dots, uh, vary by the values of six parameters that are potentially critical to controlling species richness. So here you can definitely see, despite the variability, that there is a trend between, uh, there is some relationship between richness and the number of stream captures, but there is uh, variability. And I can't hope to think of this paper by Anton uh, Antonelli at all, of uh, their work, this is empirical real data, not model data, of empirical real data of uh, climate and geologic variables and how they relate to species uh, richness. And so you can see that there are trends uh, globally. These are, are um, from um, data sets from mountains throughout the globe, uh, but there's a great amount of uh, variability. So I'm uh, putting forth here that, that variability can be explored uh, with uh, landscape evolution models. And so with the, the modeling that I'm showing here, one additional control on richness appears to be the time to speciation that can be parameterized in the model. That's generally how quickly the, the simulated species evolve. So that relationship between richness and stream capturing is steeper or more sensitive to 
uh, the um, when species we uh, evolve more rapidly than their uh, slower evolving uh, species. So in this first example, uh, to um, uh, wrap this first example up to uh, demonstrate that this process-based uh, analysis in both the biology and geology side, that's just to really drill down into potentially global variability uh, that we um, find elsewhere. And so a, another uh, shorter example, uh, before we're looking at landscapes in general, and now looking at specific, uh, specific landscapes in Northern Andes, and the uh, more specific landscape or ecosystem type, the Premos of the Northern Andes, they're high elevation ecosystems above the um, forest line. You can see that they're exceptionally diverse in the uh, Northern Andes where this uh, research is being conducted. And perhaps this diversity is one of the re reasons that Humboldt was drawn to this reason a few years ago and where he recognized that vegetation zonates with elevation because uh, temperature, air temperature, decreases with elevation. And so some preliminary work uh, research uh, that is pivotal to this is work by uh, Suzette Flauta that mapped up the extent of Primos over the last one million years, and they were able to do that using pollen uh, stored in a core extracted from a basin. And with that, they were able to uh, get several time slices of where these ecosystems or at given times of the last one million years. So uh, Suzette and now I just have a preliminary model to show you today. Uh, Suzette and I created this model of just focusing on the Eastern Cordillera of the Northern Andes and the plant species evolved by dispersal speciation and extinction processes built into species evolver, the software. And the overall fitness said simply is tuned to param uh, paramo area said another way that um, extinction is exponentially more likely as area decreases. And so on the left side is that, um, that long rectangle of the Eastern Cordillera. And this is the extent of the Primo at about 100, uh, 1 million years ago. And the number of taxa of uh, plant species, we begin with one uh, just for uh, simplicity in this presentation. And this, uh, there's a lot of subplots here, but we could just focus on this tax of richness subplot to see how richness changes over time. And you can see as uh, the extent of parameters uh, shrinks and grows, there are several radiations of species, and then there's that decay of extinction over time. And in the next slide, we can talk about what's going on, at least in the model. And so on that top plot, we have a um, uh, Climate um, peaks are hot, uh, uh, more interglacial. These are more subglacial periods. And then this is the model tax richness. Let's focus just on this cluster of radiations about half a million years ago. And so it's really, uh, so there's this, the biggest glaciation during this uh, time frame was about uh, 0.65 uh, uh, million years ago. And so as the Pramos is in a colder condition, this is the mountain profile, the Premos is large and connected. And once, one, uh, once the climate moves into an interglacial, then the Premos are broken up into a lot of uh, smaller sub Premos. And that's similar to the captured fish uh, stream example. This um, breaks up the populations into subpopulations that uh, cuts off uh, gene flow, reproductively uh, isolates them, and increases richness. And so where this model is now in its preliminary state, I can't help but think of these two quotes that are often um, brought together about um, the importance of evolution to understand biology and the importance of genetics to understand evolution. So I really think where this type of approach to modeling uh, biological evolution really does need genetics implemented within it. And with genetics implemented in these models, we can better represent the complexity and the realism of biological evolution as well as very importantly improved comparison between empirical and model data. And lastly, I envision that landscape evolution models uh, can really support process-based research in biological uh, evolution so we can uh, go beyond um, individual organisms, go beyond uh, um, 
variable correlations and start looking at the individual processes in now that we have uh, landscape evolution models, which I think has been the missing uh, piece. Thank you, Anna. Hope to take questions.